Hello everyone and welcome again to another Teacher Joseph podcast. Well, we're rapidly approaching what's known as Christmas week, and that's the week leading up to Christmas. Now, it depends on how you see it. Some people think the week begins on a Sunday, mostly religious people, and other people really just think that the week is Monday to Friday or Monday to Sunday. So depending on your point of view, what's coming up is the week before Christmas. So I hope your preparations are going well if you're in a region which celebrates Christmas. Today, we're going to talk about some phrasal verbs. Now, this is very interesting because phrasal verbs probably are the most puzzling part of learning English. And some of you who like torture and suffering love to sit down with books and just learn phrasal verbs uh, like you're some kind of a memory machine and you just recite them like a parrot. If that works for you, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But for most of us, phrasal verbs are very difficult to learn because we we don't really understand why you put a verb and a preposition together to give a third meaning. It's kind of senseless, isn't it? Why it's exactly like that, I don't know. And I'm not sure that even the best linguist would know, but we do have a few clues as to where they come from and what they're trying to mean. And that's what we're going to look at today. Okay, so uh, if you think of a phrasal verb that ends in up, have you thought of one? Well, don't worry, I'll give you one. Finish up, okay? Or another one might be to mix up to look up, to make up, um, or make up just as a standalone uh, phrase without it being a phrasal verb is also used. When we use up as part of a phrasal verb, there's actually a number of things that it's trying to indicate, okay? And each preposition in a phrasal verb isn't just there by chance. Uh, There is a reason why it's there. It's not always clear, even to me, why it's there or why we use particular ones, but there are reasons why they're being used. Let me explain. So I mentioned finish up, okay? So the word finish, of course, um, uh, is all about finishing. So there's a big clue there as to what's happening to finish up. Okay. Uh, Actually, in many cases, up suggests that an action is completed or brought to a conclusion. To clean up, for example, also is all about finishing the cleaning. It's not just completion or finality with up. There's some phrasal verbs which can suggest to us intensity or thoroughness. Up can indicate an action is done thoroughly or intensely. For example, the race is heating up. Yeah, it's telling you that it's getting exciting. If a room is heating up, it's getting hot. And if we think of mix up, it's to mix everything up completely, thoroughly, you know. So you can hear there so far that... Phrasal verbs with up in them can be all about completion. They can all be about intensity. And they also can be about upward movement, you know. For example, if you think of look up, uh, looking up at the sky, you physically are looking up. Um, To pick up is when you take something off the ground, okay. So you can hear there that, up isn't just some random preposition that
that people have decided to use. It is actually denoting something. We've spoken about completion, intensity, upward movement or direction, but up can also suggest a change or transformation. Things are looking up means things are getting better. Um, when we wake up in the morning, we're ready for the day. And women like to use makeup or to make themselves up. So up in this case is change or transformation. So completion, intensity, upward movement, change or transformation. And then, of course, there's the idiomatic usage, which is all about um, those phrasal verbs that we just don't know why we're using up. For example, to give up, which means to surrender. Why is it not give in? Well, sometimes it is. Sometimes people use in instead of up. It's exactly the same meaning. Also, wake up as well, even though it's all about an upward movement. Why is it like that? You know, uh, we, we don't know. Okay, so a lot of them are just idiomatic for no reason. But in general, we use the preposition up to talk about completion, intensity, upward movement, change or transformation, as well as the idiomatic usage. I think the problem is many of these have developed over time <clears throat> and may originally have had literal meanings related to direction or position or whatever, but they've just kind of evolved. And that's what English does. All it takes is for you to use uh, a particular thing more than once and other people to do the same and very quickly it'll find itself in the dictionary. It sounds crazy, but as I've told you before, there's no one that regulates English. There's not some government department or some place in the world, like a university, that puts new words in and takes them out. The English dictionaries simply record changes that happen in the language. That's their purpose. And it's quite exciting when they see changes happening. It makes headline news, but they have no control over how it changes. For those of you who really don't like uh, articles, I know many of you struggle with are, on, and there, just remembering to put them in, you'll be pleased to know that they're starting to disappear. More and more people aren't using them, and there will come a point when they'll just vanish. You know, language is being transformed as we speak, thanks to the internet and globalization. So understanding these things about phrasal verbs, like why we use up, is a key part of mastering a language. I'll go over some more of these in the new year. But if you're wondering, you know, why we use the prepositions after phrasal verbs, like off, on, in, and in this case, up, Hopefully, this helps you to understand that uh, they're not just random, okay? <laughs> they're there for a purpose, all right? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Christmas week uh, is rapidly approaching. I suppose for religious people, um, it actually is going to be uh, the week after next because Christmas Eve is on, I think, Sunday, Christmas Day is on Monday. So this weekend, I'll be beginning to make my all-week pasta sauce. It's a pasta sauce that I make uh, on special occasions. And basically, um, I start cooking it in my slow cooker for one day. I add all the ingredients together, and then I chill it overnight for one day. I start cooking it again for a couple of days, and then I chill it, and then I bring it to some kind of finality uh, at the end of the week. 
So when I start to do that, I'll be telling you all about it and what ingredients I'm using. You don't have to use a slow cooker for that. You can use a normal saucepan, but bear in mind it, it will be drying up quite a bit. So you need to be careful with it, of course, um, to make sure that you add enough ingredients. Other things about Christmas, well, here in the northern part of the UK, uh, it's very clear that Christmas traditions are dying. I haven't seen a Santa Claus this year here. Um, I'm told that they are all around London, but uh, Santa Claus is, um, well, it's a fixture of Christmas. I haven't seen any Santas. I think there's an inflatable one in the local shop. But people these days are more politically correct now. So the idea of Santa, you know, come little child, sit on my knee, ha, 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 ha. I think now everyone recognizes that that's just wrong. Those days have gone. So uh, as a direct result of that, Santa isn't making any appearances around here. I'm hoping to catch a glimpse of one of them. Um... But uh, I'll let you know if I do. The other weird thing about the northern part of the UK here in Scotland is that the older pagan religion is making a big comeback. Now, I saw something advertised locally uh, that on solstice, which is the shortest day of the year, the 21st of December, uh, a group of local people are getting together to celebrate the solstice. Now, this is interesting because we we don't celebrate Christmas now as a religious ritual. So it seems strange to me that many of us would be getting together to celebrate it as some kind of pagan ritual. And the weird thing about this is they're actually going to where... Uh, the witches were burned in my town. Now, I told you about this last week. We had uh, a series of witch burnings here. In reality, we actually killed women. And it was quite normal all across Europe in the uh, 18th century to do this. Uh, women who were accused of all kinds of things. But I don't know how the two things ended up getting related. I mean... The witch burnings weren't because the women were witches. It was the, because the, 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 there was some kind of mass hysteria. Uh, the, the women themselves were innocent. So what's happening next Thursday is a group of people are going to the site of the witch burnings to have a pagan ritual. But the two things aren't related. So it would seem strange to me that any kind of religious-style ritual would be attached to something that's, well, a rather dark part of our history. So it's strange. And what else is strange is the fact that it's even being done. Uh, so I think maybe there's, there's some underlying uh, reason for this that obviously I don't know. I mean, you would think that if you want to celebrate the solstice, you would go to nature. You would go to a forest or something. You You wouldn't go to where innocent women were, were killed for nothing. It, it seems very strange that the two things are placed together. So I'll be interested to hear more about that. I mean, I won't be attending on Thursday, which is the 21st. I'll be working anyway. But um, yeah, it, it shows how things are changing. Uh, people now really, really avoid religion. Churches here are closing uh, almost weekly, so things are vanishing quickly, but there's nothing replacing them. And the things that are, if this pagan ritual at the side of uh, where witches were burned is anything to go by, it, it, it looks like there is a need for something to come in there, some kind of uh, understanding or New belief? I don't know, but uh, strange what's coming, isn't it? It's a very odd thing, that. So, yeah, uh, that's happening this week. 
And aside from that, I suppose last minute Christmas shopping, um, I'll be going to see uh, the Christmas decorations in a nearby city today. So I'll be describing those for you uh, in a podcast, I hope, as well, which you'll probably hear in the coming days. Um, but this really is a, a time of great darkness. So light is very much celebrated. And, you know, it's a wonderful metaphor, that, for your English, because, you know, sometimes we struggle through with English. It, a lot of you have told me that it's it's almost like you feel blindfolded, you know, like your eyes are covered. Blindfolded means when you have a piece of cloth around your eyes. Many of you have told me that sometimes you feel like you're blindfolded, that you don't know where you're going, and you, you can't make sense of what you're learning. I fully understand that. I mean, I get like that as well in the languages I'm learning. There comes moments where nothing makes sense and it's in that darkness that you really have to make light of what you have. You have to find inspiration, motivation. You have to find ways of going on and and that's really, really important. So if, if you are feeling like that today, um, just put the book away. Wait for that inspiration to come again. Um, better still, uh, find someone or something which inspires you and let that be your light. Let that lead you back to a place of learning. And that's it from me for today. I hope you've enjoyed this. So let's talk again soon. See you. Bye.